Hey everybody, it's Uncle John, and we're back to bring you another chapter from Eeny, Meeny, Miny, Mo, and Still Mo by the author Sam Campbell. Today's chapter is chapter number 13, and it's entitled, One False Step. Let's get right to it. One cold, misty August day came an experience that has affected my walking for a long time. No, I was not crippled. In fact, there was no real physical hurt. But I felt terribly ill, and I wanted to tiptoe for the rest of my life, or step as if I were treading on eggs, or even crawl, anything but put my full weight down in a normal stride. Even now, I get little chills when I think of it. I stepped on a chipmunk. All that great big forest to walk in, millions of acres of land, and I had to big bring my big boot down on poor little beggar boy. I guess I wasn't at fault. Of course, I didn't want to do it, but it doesn't help much to explain it, for I can never forget that tender, frail little fellow under my 190 pounds of weight. The chilly weather had something to do with it. There had to be a great fire that morning, so while Jenny was brewing the coffee and getting the breakfast bacon underway, I went for some wood. Beggar Boy wanted to help. He sat on every stick of wood I reached for. When I scolded him and waved him to one side, he stood up on his hind legs, looking at me in the cute way that made me want to give him everything he desired. He simply would not take no for an answer. My mistake was that I had brought no peanuts with me. Had I but three to give him, he would have crammed them in his mouth and gone bouncing off. But that morning, he was simply irresistible. <coughs> Excuse me. The more I delayed contributing to his needs, the worse he became. He climbed my shoulders and up on the top of my head, pushing off my hat. He sat on the sticks I held in the hollow of one arm. I put him down a dozen times, but he came right back again. I tossed a few pillows. I tossed a few pebbles across the ground, pretending they were peanuts. He scampered after them, and this gave me a few seconds in which to pick up wood. But very quickly, he was back again, climbing on me, going through my pockets, scratching my ear, and once nibbling on my nose. But the pebbles were helping me to get my load of sticks. Beggar Boy would run after anything I threw. It really looked stupid of him. He chased stones that were as large as he, seeming to have no idea what they were until he had sniffed them. Once, I tossed a big block of fireplace wood. He ran after it just the same, discovered it was not a peanut, and ran back to me again. Finally, a last handful of gravel thrown to some distance kept him away until I had all the wood I could carry. Then I stepped backward to go toward the cabin. As I did, a most sickly sensation crept over me. Under my heel, I could feel something much softer than the packed earth of our woodpile path. There came a tiny little squeak. Instinctively, I bent my knee and fell to the ground to lift my weight from that foot. The wood was tossed wildly, and then I saw my worst fear realized. Beggar Boy was curled up in a little ball, quivering and giving a pathetic whine. My foot had been squarely on him, and it seemed that the very life had been crushed from him. I do not know what I said, but Jenny came hurrying from the cabin knowing that something was wrong. There were tears in her eyes as she looked at Beggar Boy. I presume the humane thing to do is to destroy him, I said, though I shrank from the thought. You need not see it. You go back to the cabin, and I'll take care of him. But Jenny did not approve of my plan. She is so filled with the conviction that health, happiness, life, and goodness are the natural constituents of the world that she does not give in to tragedy. No, she said firmly. Let's not do that. Beggar Boy deserves a chance. I feel he will pull through. Please, take him into the tent where the other animals won't bother him. We picked up the tiny creature and examined him. He was still breathing, though it seemed that he was hurt internally, as he kept tightly curled in a little ball. Occasionally, he would shake a little, but there was no other movement. We carried him into Duke's tent, spread a towel on the floor, and built a warm, dark shelter over him, made of balsam boughs covered with the wool cloth. We tried to feed him a bit of water with an eyedropper. He would not take it. 
In fact, I felt that Jenny's hope was useless, that the little fellow was already gone. There seems to be nothing we can do for him, I said. But still, Jenny would not give him up. There is something we can do for him, she said firmly. There is prayer. He is not beyond the reach of that. Yes, there was prayer. He was such a mite to pray over, only a little chipmunk in a vast world, and yet we realized that instant that it was tremendously important to lift him up out of his trouble. We must bring him back, if for no other reason than to prove that life and goodness are not helpless, that there is something more powerful than the claims of evil, and we must prove that the creator of this world we live in is not indifferent to the welfare of his creation, that there is a way to reach a power beyond the human when there is need. We prayed for the recovery of Beggar Boy. We watched over him through the day and the night. But it is probable I would never have written this incident had it not been for a letter that came the next day. Strange that we were so self-conscious when it comes to speaking of things of, of faith. But it is usually, as Emerson has said, we are ashamed of that divine idea each of us represents. Something tries to make us timid about our best thoughts, and of late years it has been almost taboo for anyone to admit that he prays. The letter was from Duke. It savored of the South Seas, of jungles and lurking danger. He said little about them, but we could feel them in the background. He had finished his ocean journey and was somewhere in the South Pacific. That was all he could tell. He was well, and so was Lieutenant Stilmo. Someday I'll tell you what happened on the sea, he said. All I can say now is we are grateful to be alive. There was a brief but terrifying experience. Let me tell you, every last one of us knelt in prayer. I prayed as I never had before. Lieutenant Stilmo prayed beside me. One tough old G.I. came up saying he didn't know how to pray and wanted to listen to our prayers. We didn't know much about it either, but we tried our best. You get rid of self-consciousness at a time like that, but we came through without the loss of a man, and some call it a miracle that we did. You may be sure there is many a prayer said here in these jungle nights when everything in the world seems against you, but everything in heaven is in your favor. So big, strong, carefree Duke was praying. It helped us to know this. He was praying that evil be held powerless and that good triumph. Certainly we could do no less. Beggar Boy lingered through five days without the slightest change. His little gasping breath kept on, and at first he squeaked over so ever so softly through though this sound. Beggar Boy lingered through five days without the slightest change. His little gasping breath kept on, and at first he squeaked ever so softly, though this sound stopped after two days. In faith we put a saucer of water near him and kept bread softened in milk where he could get it. It tested us severely as we went hour after hour, day after day, to the tiny creature to find that he lay in exactly the same position. Jenny never wavered in her faith. She prayed constantly, and it seems this is the way such things must be done. I shall never forget the joy in her voice the sixth day when she went to see Beggar Boy. Sam, he is moving! He is crawling toward me! Come quickly! she cried. I went quickly, more quickly than I had gone anywhere for a long time. It was true. Our pet was moving, slowly, painfully, in pathetic little steps across the floor toward Jenny. She was kneeling to receive him and cupped him in her hands. There were tears in her eyes, but they were happy ones. I knew it, I knew it, she was saying. Beggar boy is going to be all right. Yet at the moment, he seemed far from all right. One little foot was not working at all, his whole body bent in a curve toward the injured side while one eye was completely closed. But there was improvement. He had regained consciousness. There was something to work on now. Jenny held tenaciously to her prayers. Beggar boy was not saved to be a cripple, she insisted. He must be restored to his full strength and activity. Each hour, there was gain after that. 
He began eating ever so little at first, but within a few days he was taking good quantities of food. He even tried, in pitiful ways, to carry some peanut crumbs away and store them in a corner of the tent. His body straightened a bit, and he began to use the one foot that had troubled him. When we entered the tent house, he would come scurrying across the floor and try to jump up in our hands. Still, the one eye stayed shut. It was on the fifth day that signs of recovery had begun to appear. It was on the fifth day after signs of recovery had begun to appear that a great event happened. This was the eleventh day since the accident. Jenny went to the tent early in the morning, carrying a dish of warm milk as was her custom. She opened the door, and I heard her cry, There he goes! Beggar Boy had dashed right by her and out into the woods. He ran awkwardly, but with considerable speed. At first, we thought we should catch him and keep him confined in the tent, but quickly he convinced us otherwise. It was time for him to be about his business, and his happiness and his liberty and recovery kept us laughing. The speed with which he went about amazed us, for none of his legs was really working very well. But they were good enough for him, and he ran back and forth, apparently for the sheer joy of being free once more. When in a few moments he ran up to us, we noticed that his bad eye had opened. What happened, I don't know. Perhaps he knew of some way of brushing it against Perhaps he knew of some way of brushing it against the trees or ferns to clear the lids. Anyway, he was seeing with both eyes and running with all four feet, and it was just grand. Beggar Boy disappeared into the fern-covered hillside where he had dug his home. We did not see him for several days. Then one night, when we sat before a campfire, we heard a little noise in the leaves. Creeping out of the darkness into the light of the flames came Beggar Boy searching for food. You may be sure that he got plenty. I believe we would have given him a whole truckload of peanuts if he could have taken care of them. His ailments were disappearing. There was still a bit of a limp in his run, but obviously it was being overcome. The interesting thing was that he came out at night, quite against the habits of chipmunks in general. As we saw him frequently after dark in the following nights, we concluded that he felt instinctively that it was safer to be out when his rivals and many of his enemies were asleep. Before the summer was done, Beggar Boy was completely healed, with only a little scar near the injured eye as a remainder of his accident. He held not the least resentment against me, but became the most devoted and friendly of our chipmunks. In the course of time, a letter from us told Duke of this incident, and he replied, You may think that experience with Beggar Boy a small matter, but it is important to us here. We have read your letter aloud to the boys, and they want to thank you for it. Our whole lives now are based on proving the power of prayer. Some way, there seems to be no hope unless that is proved. If what prayer represents were untrue, then we would be lost. Prayer proves God, and only the existence of God makes the things we are doing endurable. Beggar Boy's recovery was a victory for us all. Give the little rascal an extra bushel of peanuts for me, and let's all do a lot more pray. And that's the end of chapter number 13. Come back next time, and Aunt Nikki is going to bring you chapter 14, which is entitled, Missing in Action. You have to come back tomorrow to find out what that's about. See you then.